Have you ever wondered if living for other people can make you happier and get you towards your goals? That's what we'll talk about today. True love is selfless. It is prepared to sacrifice. Sadhu Vaswani. Hello, this is Jill from the North Woods. We're going to continue our conversation about the book from Joshua Becker, Things That Matter, Overcoming Distractions to Pursue a More Meaningful Life. He talks a lot about minimalism in this book, even though this book isn't about minimalism. Again, he was sort of the father of the minimalism movement. But he says that we have so much stuff that is it getting in our way? Is it causing us to tie up our money in things we don't even care about? And I get that. You know, if you buy an Xbox, and I'm not saying anything's wrong with an Xbox, suddenly you're buying it, backup batteries and storage devices and controllers, and sometimes it breaks, and it also needs those games too. And suddenly something that cost a mere four or five hundred dollars is well over a thousand dollars. So when we have too much stuff, is it possible that our stuff, our shopping and all the other things is tying up so much money we can't do the thing we dream of doing? He says the number two, is it taking up our time so that we can't do the thing we want to do? He mentions that every time we have a new possession, it loads on top of us thoughts, time, all these activities. You never buy anything and just buy it and be done with it. It always comes with a cost of our time and a cost of our money. So if we get less things, we have less things, it's no longer tying us up. You don't think stuff takes up your time, all the stuff you have? What about moving it? What if you were to move today? How much stuff would you take with you and how much stuff would you have to process? Or even when I cleaned out this room to turn it into a recording studio, so much stuff that I suddenly had to move out of here, clean up the area, find storage for it, organize it in such a way, maybe buy a bin, maybe buy a rack to store my bins. Everything we have causes more work, costs more money. So he says, and I'm not going to go into it too much in this podcast because I wanted to make this about focusing on important things, but if we can clear out the clutter, clear out the extra stuff in our lives, we will find more time, more money, and more ability to do the things we really want to do. And I do believe that he's correct, that all the stuff is stealing our money, is stealing our time. And he says even worse, the third thing, obscuring our focus, which means we have so much stuff that we can't focus on the thing that matters the most to us anymore. And that's the most damaging thing of all. If we steal our time and our money, that's bad. But now if we no longer see the thing that's important to us, no longer have the freedom to do what we want to do with our lives. He says it's important that you know that once you start owning less stuff, you stop wanting less stuff. Think about it like salt. As soon as you stop using so much salt, you find you don't need to use as much salt. It makes you numb to how much salt you're eating when you salt things all the time. I know, I salt things all the time. But when you have stuff and you buy stuff and it becomes this craving. My friend said to me the other day, you know, when Amazon doesn't come by a couple times a week, it starts to get lonely around here. And she's right. It's funny how much you might look forward to a package coming or something interesting coming. But once we get out of that loop of just expecting a package or a box or a delivery to come, we'll stop wanting it less too. And so he wants us to just try it a little bit and see if we can get there. He kind of calls back to the Marie Kondo, does this item spark joy? And if you don't know, she wrote a book where you go around in your house trying to clean up and get rid of stuff. And he appreciates how she really started bringing focus on people getting rid of things. But when she asks each individual item, does this spark joy? The real question, he says, is does this promote a purpose? And I like that a lot better. My stuff does not spark joy. But my stuff allows me to do things. When I want to have a podcast, now I have a microphone and a boom arm and a monitor and all the things I need to do a podcast. So it has purpose. 
But then I have a number of things that are just sitting in boxes and have been sitting in boxes for a long time. There's no purpose there at all. So I like his question about asking all the things that exist in your life, in your house, does this have a purpose? And this is what I liked about this particular comment, that when we get rid of things and we reduce how much stuff we have, it's not about being a minimalist or owning nothing. It's about owning the right things, the right number of things. And so as I've been going through my house and cleaning it and getting rid of things, that's been my thought about all of this. I like all the books in my house. I used to have a ton of books in this house and bookcases filled with it. And you know what? When I walked in that room, I just love that room full of books. But most of them were books I finished or books that I was interested at the time. And now I'm no longer interested in those books. I should give them away and give them to someone who could maybe have some purpose for those books. I remember I was really into kite building. I was excited. That was going to be my next new hobby. I'm not as interested in that anymore. It was neat. It was neat learning about kite building. But in the end, wouldn't that be better if that book went to someone who would actually build new kites with them? So instead, I'm getting rid of things so that maybe it helps fulfill someone else's purpose. And it's no longer fulfilling mine. And getting rid of things that take our attention, that we're spending so much time trying to impress people and ranting and raving about work or doing silly things, he says on TikTok, that we're not actually doing the thing that really matters. And we don't have to get praise for the things that really matter because once we start doing it, we'll know this is the right thing. This is the thing I'm good at. This is the thing I can influence with my gifts. And so suddenly it just becomes better. And he says that you can make yourself smaller and let other people be bigger in order to have that success in life. And when you do, you'll be very happy about it. When I was doing my job as a consultant, one of my biggest mental rules that I had is always make the customer look good. You can go into a consulting job and decide you're going to make yourself look great, that you're going to be the best, you're going to take credit for all the things you do, and show everyone how important you are is when you make other people look good. When you make a staff empowered so they could do their job, even when they were a little bit scared a couple of days ago, now you've made a friend, you've made an impact on that company because you taught someone how to be independent in whatever it is you're doing. For me, it was software. If I could teach someone to use software and not be afraid of it and then show their own bosses what a great asset they are to the company and then show that company how they can all work together, that just made my life. Because if you as a consultant tried to work for yourself, tried to make yourself the center game, people are going to find you obnoxious and they're going to find you to be someone who just walks around trying to steal other people's glory. But when you give it away, you're kind to people. You are compassionate with them. And when you have that ability, you'll be known for that. And people will recognize, not that you're the greatest consultant in the world that gives the bestest advice ever, and, but people will realize you're the person who can enable other people to succeed. And there is no better reputation on the planet than that. People will know you because you're kind. They know that you are the kind of person that when you have tough times, you get back up and you don't give up. Boy, you know, and that's what you want. Those are the reputations you want, not as being the best, the most showy-offy. You want to be known for your kindness, your perseverance, your empathy, your ability to listen to other people, and even your persistence when it comes to things of faith, family, you know, that you're the, the kind of person that other people rely on. And I think those skills that he mentions are so important in our world. And sometimes we just don't see it that often. But when people see that we're fun to work with, we're nice to work with, we encourage other people, we're always a person who settles fights instead of creating fights, 
think we live in a world that now we're so worried about people who cause fights, cause angst in a team. I know that in my own company, we were a small company for years. And someone said to me, well, at some point, you just have to hire someone, right? If you have a position that's open and you can't find the right person, you just pick someone. And I was like, no, you don't do that because that one person can spoil an entire team. Personally, I would rather work harder without that spot filled than fill it with just anybody. So again, you want to have someone who's that peacemaker, that nice person, that joyful person. I mean, think about the things that you like in the work world. Think about the things that you like when you're around people. What types of people do you enjoy being with? Then be that person. You try to be sort of a climbing up the scale jerk that you walk over everybody, that you suck out all the knowledge that you can from your teammates and then walk over their heads to the next promotion. It's not someone you would want to work with, and it's not what other people want to work with either. And so when it comes time, regardless of what job you're in, people will remember you because you're the kind of person they want to be with. And he says that when we think about what we do, and I'm bringing it out in a job, but it doesn't have to be a job. But when we found that fulfillment, that focus on the thing that we're good at and that we like doing and how we help other people, we will get joy out of it because we see the impact we're having in other people. We're the kind of person others want to be with. And we can use our energies into making life better. And when we get done at the end of the day, we're fulfilled, we're not exhausted. We're not thinking about retirement. We're thinking about the blessings we're getting from helping other people. Towards the end of the book, he gets wrapped up in retirement and why we think we should just stop working and stop doing things, which is funny because I want to stop working and stop doing things because I want to do other things sometime that I want to work with. I've worked in a job since I've been probably around eight, nine years old. I started babysitting. Then I worked in the school office. Remember, I was dirt poor when I grew up. So me getting money to be able to go on school trips and do other things was exciting to me. And so I worked from a very early age. But while he's down on retirement, I'm pretty excited about it. Because maybe for once in my life, I'll get to do the things I want to do. But I think he has a good point that that doesn't mean we're going to give up on life. We're not going to just sit there and watch TV. We're not just going to sit there like a lump and do nothing. Maybe we slow down a little bit. Maybe we have less hours. Maybe we do something we're more geared towards doing. Something that we tried to do, we never had a chance. Maybe we get a chance to mentor other people and help other people. But he says, don't retire, but retire with a purpose. And so our whole lives, even from our young time, our working world time, and our older age, we should always have that purpose. He says, quote, please don't view your work as something to be endured or escaped. Instead, rethink your work. Regain focus and motivation to use your passions and abilities to contribute good to a society in need of them. Your work is a way of showing love to others. People don't think about work as love, but I think it's such a valuable way to think about what we do and how we can help other people. If we're just looking at work as something that we can escape, maybe we're needing to think about work as a way of serving our community and helping other people. And you know what? Even if we change jobs at the end of our work world, that work will never stop because we will always be someone who can be counted on to help other people. I think if we're doing it right. He gives another quote by Donald Miller, who someday I'll do a book from Donald Miller. He's really an incredible guy. But the quote is, right before you die, you'll realize your whole life was about loving people and you watched too much television. Guess that's why I'm probably trying to watch less television. I want to get away from that and get away from focused on TV so much. And not because it was bad or not because television is bad. But because I feel at some point I lost control to television 
and it took up too much of my life. Now I want it to be a little accent of something I do, not what I do every day. And I think I've gotten there. The pandemic really showed me how to make better use of my time. And now I reduced my television by quite a bit. I reduced my gaming quite a bit. And you know why? Because I found podcasting and I love podcasting so much. I found the thing that really makes it matter to me. And so I hope that that's the point, is that you can find the thing that really matters to you. What can you do that will make all the difference in other people's lives? Perhaps you're good at music and you can bring joy to people through your music or your art or you're organized and you can help other people stay organized when they're not very good at it. Don't think about the world and everything in it as a paycheck, but think of it as something that you can do and that you're walking towards. He gives us analogy of stumbling backward, but a lot of times all the things that we're doing in our lives, we're just stumbling backwards into. We stumble backwards into watching television, into using so much technology and getting distracted by TikTok and all the things or the games or everything like this. But instead of stumbling backwards into something, he has a challenge for all of us. He wants us to rebel. He wants us to turn off our devices, turn off our games, turn off the TV, do a digital detox. We're not going to talk much about that. But he wants you to spend not one more ounce of time on a device you don't intend to, that you stop backing into this. And that you can stop feeling guilty about the time you're spending on it because you've taken control. You're missing out on life. And if you can regain your life, you'll be able to do the things you really want to do. He says there's all sorts of things that you can do to be creative, from writing blogs, taking photographs and sharing them with people, teaching other people, learning new things. There's so much to do in our lives. That sometimes when we back into activities and not walk intentionally into activities, we're missing out on the very things that will make us exciting. And that we need to see tech and most things in life as a tool. We right now are using them to distract ourselves almost our entire lives from doing anything. And we've talked about it a million times about how technology is trying to addict us. It's using that dopamine hit. It's trying to drag us in and then trying to prevent us from leaving. As soon as you realize this is a plot against your life and your time, be rubble, he says. Fight back and tell them they're not going to steal your life anymore. You're in control of this. And once you do, once you've taken back your life, Now you're the rebel. And if you stop living for yourself, you start helping other people, you're also countercultural. The whole society is telling you to be selfish, do your own thing, be angry, be mad at everyone. But every time you fight back on all of those messages, you're countercultural, you're a rebel, you're a nonconformist, and you are taking control of your life and living life on your own terms. And he says in the end that we can ask, is there a way I can make my relationships healthier? Help the poor be better off. Help the sick be healthier. Help the uneducated be better informed. That doesn't mean telling your neighbors what you think about them or their opinions. (laughs) Or can we make the physical world better? Create beauty or create kindness. I think all of these are good goals, but again, he says that you can have that commitment. We talked about the commitment at the beginning of this series, and he has a little bit of a change to it. He says, today, I will remove distractions so that I can blank. You got to fill in the blank. He gives a chart that talks about your abilities, your passions, and the needs of others intersecting. And when you find that, that's purpose. And again, it's a little bit like the ikigai thing. But once you found that intersection, you're going to have to pursue it 
and give it energy and figure out what really makes you excited in life. What do you care about in life? Someone phrased it as, what makes you cry? (laughs) What worries you? That's where you're going to find your purpose. And then once you figure out how to apply it to the things that you're great at, that's where it all comes together. So my challenge to you is can you think of one way where you have a gift or a talent that you can start giving to other people? Maybe you can help someone who needs a hand here or there. Maybe it's a way that you can raise money or work for a nonprofit organization. Or it strikes me in this world that there are so many people who don't have parents who tell them how to live their best life, get on the right track? Is there someone you could mentor or help in a way that will help them get to have a better life? Think it over and try taking one small action towards living a more selfless life. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. You're welcome to email me at jill at smallsteps.com or contact me on Twitter. If there's something that I can do for you, a topic I can talk about, please let me know. And remember, our walk to help other people starts with small steps.